Chapter 6. Non-attachment is complete self-abnegation. Just as every action that emanates from us comes back to us as reaction, even so our actions may act on other people and theirs on us. Perhaps all of you have observed as a fact that when persons do evil actions they become more and more evil, and when they begin to do good they become stronger and stronger and learn to do good at all times. This intensification of the influence of action cannot be explained on any other ground than we can act and react upon each other. To take an illustration from physical science, when I am doing a certain action, my mind may be said to be in a certain state of vibration. All minds which are in similar circumstances will have the tendency to be affected by my mind. If there are different musical instruments tuned alike in one room, all of you may have noticed that when one is struck, the others have the tendency to vibrate so as to give the same note. So all the minds that have the same tension, so to say, will be equally affected by the same thought. Of course, this influence of thought on mind will vary according to distance and other causes, but the mind is always open to affection. Suppose I am doing an evil act, my mind is in a certain state of vibration, and all minds in the universe, which are in a similar state, have the possibility of being affected by the vibration of my mind. So when I am doing a good action, my mind is in another state of vibration, and all minds, similarly strong, have the possibility of being affected by my mind. And this power of mind upon mind is more or less according as the force of the tension is greater or less. Following this simile further, it is quite possible that, just as light waves may travel for millions of years before they reach any object, so thought waves may also travel hundreds of years before they meet an object with which they vibrate in unison. It is quite possible, therefore, that this atmosphere of ours is full of such thought pulsations, both good and evil. Every thought projected from every brain goes on pulsating, as it were, until it meets a fit object that will receive it. Any mind which is open to receive some of these impulses will be taken them immediately. So when a man is doing evil action, he has brought his mind to a certain state of tension, and all of his ways which correspond to that state of tension and which may be said to be already in the atmosphere, will struggle to enter into his mind. That is why any evildoer generally goes on doing more and more evil, his actions become intensified. Such also will be the case with the doer of good. He will open himself to all the good waves that are in the atmosphere, and his good actions also will become intensified. We run, therefore, a twofold danger in doing evil. First, we open ourselves to all the evil influences surrounding us. Secondly, we create evil which affects others, maybe hundreds of years hence. In doing evil, we injure ourselves and others also. In doing good, we do good to ourselves and to others as well. And like all other forces in man, these forces of good and evil also gather strength from outside. According to karma yoga, the action one has done cannot be destroyed until it has borne its fruit. No power in nature can stop it from yielding its results. If I do any evil action, I must suffer for it. There is no power in this universe to stop or stay it. Similarly, if I do a good action, there is no power in the universe which can stop its bearing good results. The cause must have its effect. Nothing can prevent or restrain it. Now comes a very fine and serious question about karma yoga, namely, that these actions of ours, both good and evil, are intimately connected with each other. We cannot put a line of demarcation and say, this action is entirely good and this is entirely evil. There is no action which does not bear good and evil fruit at the same time. To take the nearest example, I am talking to you and some of you perhaps think I am doing good. At the same time, I am perhaps killing thousands of microbes in the atmosphere. I am thus doing evil to something else. When it is very near to us and affects those we know, we say that it is very good action if it affects them in a good manner. For instance, you may call my speaking to you very good, but the microbes will not. The microbes you do not see, but yourself you do see. The way in which my talk affects you is obvious to you, but how it affects the microbes is not so obvious. And so, if we analyze our evil actions also, we may find that some good possibly results from them somewhere. He who in good actions sees that there is something evil in it, and in the midst of evil sees that there is something good in it somewhere, has known the secret of work. But what follows from it? That, howsoever we may try, there cannot be any action which is perfectly pure, or any which is perfectly impure, taking purity and impurity in the sense of injury and non-injury. We cannot breathe or live without injuring others, and every bit of the food we eat is taken away from another's mouth. 
Our very lives are crowding out other lives. It may be men or animals or small microbes, but someone or other of these we have to crowd out. That being the case, it naturally follows that perfection can never be attained by work. We may work all through eternity, and there will be no way out of this intricate maze. You may work on and on and on. There will be no end to this inevitable association of good and evil and the result of work. The second point to consider is, what is the end of work? We find the vast majority of people in every country believing that there will be a time when this world will become perfect, when there will be no disease, no death, no unhappiness, no wickedness. That is a very good idea, a very good motive power to inspire and uplift the ignorant. But if we think for a moment, we shall find on the very face of it that it cannot be so. How can it be that seeing that good and evil are the obverse and reverse of the same coin? How can you have a good without evil at the same time? What is meant by perfection? A perfect life is a contradiction in terms. Life itself is a state of continuous struggle between ourselves and everything outside. Every moment we are fighting actually with external nature, and if we are defeated, our life has to go. It is, for an instant, a continuous struggle for food and air. If food or air fails, we die. Life is not a simple and smoothly flowing thing, but it is a compound effect. This complex struggle between something inside an external world is what we call life. So it is clear that when this struggle ceases, there will be an end to life. What is meant by ideal happiness is the cessation of this struggle, but then life will cease, for the struggle can only cease when life itself has ceased. We have seen already that in helping the world we help ourselves. The main effect of work done for others is to purify ourselves. By means of the constant effort to do good to others, we are trying to forget ourselves. This forgetfulness of self is the one great lesson we have to learn in life. Man thinks foolishly that he can make himself happy, and after years of struggle finds out at last that true happiness consists in killing selfishness, and that no one can make him happy except himself. Every act of charity, every thought of sympathy, every action of help, every good deed is taking so much of self-importance away from the little selves and making us think of ourselves as the lowest and the least, and therefore it is all good. Here we find that jhana, bhakti, and karma all come to one point. The highest ideal is eternal and entire self-abnegation, where there is no I, but all is thou. And whether he is conscious or unconscious of it, karma yoga leads man to that end. A religious preacher may become horrified at the idea of an impersonal God. He may insist on a personal God and wish to keep up his own identity and individuality. Whatever he may mean by that. But his ideas of ethics, if they are really good, cannot be but based on the highest self-abnegation. It is the basis of all morality. You may extend it to men or animals or angels. It is the one basic idea, the one fundamental principle running through all ethical systems. You will find various classes of men in this world. First, there are the God-men, whose self-abnegation is complete, and who do only good to others even at the sacrifice of their own lives. These are the highest of men. If there are a hundred of such in any country, that country need never despair. But they are unfortunately too few. Then there are the good men who do good to others so long as it does not injure themselves. And there is a third class who to do good to themselves injure others. It is said by a Sanskrit poet that there is a fourth unnameable class of people who injures others merely for injury's sake. Just as there are at one pole of existence the highest good men who do good for the sake of doing good, so at the other pole there are others who injure others just for the sake of the injury. They do not gain anything thereby, but it is their nature to do evil. Here are two Sanskrit words. The one is pravritti, which means revolving towards, and the other is nivritti, which means revolving away. The revolving towards is what we call the world, the I and mine. It includes all those things which are always enriching that me by wealth and money and power and name and fame, and which are of grasping nature, always tending to accumulate everything in one center, that center being myself. That is pravritti, the natural tendency of every human being taking everything from everywhere and heaping it around one center, that center being man's own sweet self. When this tendency begins to break, when it is nivritti or going away from, then begin morality and religion. 
Both pravritti and nivritti are of the nature of work. The former is evil work, and the latter is good work. This nivritti is the fundamental basis of all morality and of all religion, and the very perfection of its entire self-abnegation, readiness to sacrifice mind and body and everything for another being. When a man has reached that state, he has attained to the perfection of karma yoga. This is the highest result of good works. Although a man has not studied a single system of philosophy, although he does not believe in any god and never has believed, although he has not prayed even once in his whole life, if the simple power of good action has brought him to the state where he is ready to give up his life and all else for others, he has arrived at the same point to which the religious man will come through his prayer and the philosopher through his knowledge. And so you may find that the philosopher the worker and the devotee all meet at one point, that one point being self-abnegation. However much their system of philosophy and religion may differ, all mankind stand in reverence and awe before the man who is ready to sacrifice himself for others. Here it is not at all any question of creed or doctrine. Even men who are very much opposed to all religious ideas, when they see one of these acts of complete self-sacrifice, feel that they must revere it. Have you not seen even the most bigoted Christian, when he reads Edwin Arnold's Light of Asia, stand in reverence of Buddha, who preached no God, preached nothing but self-sacrifice? The only thing is that the bigot does not know that his own end and aim in life is exactly the same as that of those who form from where he differs. The worshipper, by keeping constantly before him the idea of God and a surrounding of good, comes to the same point at last and says, Thy will be done and keeps nothing to himself. That is self-abnegation. The philosopher, with his knowledge, sees that the seeming self is a delusion, and easily gives it up. It is self-abnegation. So karma, bhakti, and jhana all meet here, and this is what was meant by all the great preachers of ancient times when they taught that God is not the world. There is one thing which is the world and another which is God, and this distinction is very true. What they mean by world is selfishness. Unselfishness is God. One may live on a throne in a golden palace and be perfectly unselfish, and then he is in God. Another may live in a hut and wear rags and have nothing in the world, yet if he is selfish, he is intensely merged into the world. To come back to one of my main points, we say that we cannot do good without at the same time doing some evil or do evil without doing some good. Knowing this, how can we work? There have, therefore, been sects in this world who have in an astoundingly preposterous way preached slow suicide as the only means to get out of the world. Because if a man lives, he has to kill poor little animals and plants or do injury to something or someone. So according to them, the only way out of the world is to die. The Jains have preached this doctrine as their highest ideal. This teaching seems to be very logical, but the true solution is found in the Gita. It is the theory of non-attachment, to be attached to nothing while doing our work of life. Know that you are separated entirely from the world, though you are in the world, and that whatever you may be doing in it, you are not doing it for your own sake. Any action that you do for yourself will bring its effect to bear upon you. If it is a good action, they will have to take the good effect, and if bad, you will have to take the bad effect. But any action that is not done for your own sake, whatever it be, will have no effect on you. There is to be found a very expressive sentence in our scripture embodying this idea. Even if he kill the whole universe, or be himself killed, he is neither the killer nor the killed, when he knows that he is not acting for himself at all. Therefore karma yoga teaches, do not give up the world, live in the world, imbibe its influences as much as you can, but if it be for your own enjoyment's sake, work not at all. Enjoyment should not be the goal. First kill yourself and then take the whole world as yourself, as the old Christians used to say. The old man must die. This old man is a selfish idea that the whole world is made for our enjoyment. Foolish parents teach their children to pray, O Lord, thou hast created this sun for me and this moon for me. As if the Lord has had nothing else to do than to create everything for these babies. Do not teach your children such nonsense. Then again, there are people who are foolish in another way. They teach us that all these animals were created for us to kill and eat, and that this universe is for the enjoyment of man. 
That is all foolishness. A tiger may say, Man was created for me, and pray, O Lord, how wicked are these men, who do not come and place themselves before me to be eaten. They are breaking your law. If the world is created for us, we are also created for the world. That this world is created for our enjoyment is the most wicked idea that holds us down. This world is not for our sake. Millions pass out of it every year. The world does not feel it. Millions of others are supplied in their place just as much as the world is for us. So we are also for the world. To work properly, therefore, you first have to give up the idea of attachment. Secondly, do not mix in the fray. Hold yourself as a witness and go on working. My master used to say, look upon your children as a nurse does. The nurse will take your baby and fondle it and play with it and behave toward it as gently as if it were her own child, but as soon as you give her notice to quit, she is ready to start off bag and baggage from the house. Everything in the shape of attachment is forgotten. It will not give the ordinary nurse the least pang to leave your children and take up other children. Even so are you to be with all that you consider your own. You are the nurse, and if you believe in God, believe that all these things which you consider yours are really His. The greatest weaknesses often insinuates itself as the greatest good and strength. It is a weakness to think that any one is dependent on me and that I can do good to another. This belief is the mother of all attachment, and through this attachment comes all of our pain. We must inform our minds that no one in this universe depends upon us, not one beggar depends on our charity, not one soul on our kindness, not one living thing on our help. All are helped on by nature, and will be so helped even though millions of us were not here. The course of nature will not stop for such as you and me. It is, as already pointed out, only a blessed privilege to you and to me that we are allowed in the way of helping others to educate ourselves. This is a great lesson to learn in life, and when we have learned it fully, we shall never be unhappy. We can go and mix without harm in society anywhere and everywhere. You may have wives and husbands and regiments of servants and kingdoms to govern. If only you act on the principle that the world is not for you and does not inevitably need you, they can do you no harm. This very year some of your friends may have died. Is the world waiting without going on for them to come again? Is it currently stopped? No, it goes on. So drive out of your mind the idea that you have to do something for the world. The world does not require any help from you. It is sheer nonsense on the part of any man to think that he is born to help the world. It is simply pride. It is selfishness insinuating itself in the form of virtue. When you have trained your mind and your nerves to realize this idea of the world's non-dependence on you or on anyone, then there will be no reaction in the form of pain resulting from work. When you give something to a man and expect nothing, do not even expect the man to be grateful. His ingratitude will not tell upon you because you never expected anything, never thought you had any right to anything in the way of return. You gave him what he deserved. His own karma got it for him. Your karma made you the carrier thereof. Why should you be proud of giving him something anyway? You are the porter that carried the money or any other kind of gift, and the world deserved it by its own karma. Where is then the reason for pride in you? There is nothing very great in what you give the world. When you have acquired the feeling of non-attachment, there will then be neither good nor evil for you. It is only selfishness that causes the difference between good and evil. It is a very hard thing to understand. But you will come to learn in time that nothing in the universe has power over you until you allow it to exercise such a power. Nothing has power over the self of man until the self becomes a fool and loses independence. So by non-attachment you overcome and deny the power of anything to act upon you. It is very easy to say that nothing has the right to act upon you until you allow it to do so. But what is a true sign of the man who really does not allow anything to work upon it, who is neither happy nor unhappy when acted upon by the external world? The sign is that good or ill fortune causes no change in his mind. In all conditions he continues to remain the same. There was a great sage in India called Vyasa. This Vyasa is known as the author of the Vedantic aphorisms and was a holy man. His father had tried to become a very perfect man and had failed. He himself did not succeed perfectly, but his son, Shuka, was born perfect. Vyasa taught his son wisdom, and after teaching him the knowledge of truth himself, he sent him to the court of King Janaka. He was a great king and was called Janaka Vidha. 
Vidha means without a body. Although a king, he had entirely forgotten that he was a body. He felt that he was spirit all the time. This boy, Shuka, was sent to be taught by him. The king knew that Vyasa's son was coming to him to learn wisdom, so he made certain arrangements beforehand. And when the boy presented himself at the gate of the palace, the guards took no notice of him whatsoever. They only gave him a seat, and he sat there for three days and nights, nobody speaking to him, nobody asking him who he was or whence he was. He was the son of a very great sage. His father was honored by the whole country, and he himself was a most respectable person. Yet the low, vulgar guards of the palace would take no notice of him. After that, suddenly the minister of the kings and all the big officials came there and received him with the greatest of honors. They conducted him in and showed him into splendid rooms, gave him the most fragrant bath and wonderful dresses, and for eight days they kept him there in all kinds of luxury. That solemnly serene face of Shukya did not change, even to the smallest extent, by the change in the treatment accorded to him. He was the same in the midst of his luxury as when waiting on the door. Then he was brought before the king. The king was on his throne, music was playing, and dancing and other amusements were going on. The king then gave him a cup of milk, full to the brim, and asked him to go seven times around the hall without spilling even a drop. The boy took the cup and proceeded in the midst of the music and the attraction of the beautiful faces. As desired by the king, seven times did he go around, and not a drop of the milk was spilt. The boy's mind could not be attracted by anything in the world unless he allowed it to affect him. And when he brought the cup to the king, the king said to him, What your father has taught you, and what you have learned yourself, I can only repeat. You have known the truth. Go home. Thus the man that has practiced control over himself cannot be acted upon by anything outside. There is no more slavery for him. His mind has become free. Such a man alone is fit to live well in the world. We generally find men holding two opinions regarding the world. Some are pessimists and say, How horrible this world is! How wicked! Some others are optimists and say, How beautiful this world is! How wonderful! To those who have not controlled their own minds, the world is full either of evil or at best a mixture of good and evil. This very world will become to us an optimistic world when we become masters of our own mind. Nothing will then work upon us as good or evil. We shall find everything to be in its proper place to be harmonious. Some men who begin by saying that the world is a hell often end by saying that it is a heaven when they succeed in the practice of self-control. If we are genuine karman yogis and wish to train ourselves to the attainment of this state, wherever we may begin, we are sure to end in perfect self-abnegation. And as soon as this seeming self is gone, the whole world, which at first appears to us to be filled with evil, will appear to be heaven itself and full of blessedness. Its very atmosphere will be blessed. Every human face there will be God. Such is the end and aim of karma yoga, and such is its perfection in practical life. Our various yogas do not conflict with each other. Each of them leads us to the same goal and makes us perfect. Only each has to be strenuously practiced. The whole secret is in practicing. First you have to hear, then think and then practice. This is true of every yoga. You have first to hear about it and understand what it is, and many things which you do not understand will be made clear to you by constant hearing and thinking. It is hard to understand everything at once. The explanation of everything is, after all, in yourself. No one was ever really taught by another. Each of us has to teach himself. The external teacher offers only the suggestion which rouses the internal teacher to work to understand things. Then things will be made clearer to us by our own power of perception and thought, and we shall realize them in our own souls. And that realization will grow into the intense power of will. First it is feeling, then it becomes willing, and out of that willing comes a tremendous force for work that will go through every vein, nerve, and muscle, until the whole mass of your body is changed into an instrument of the unselfish yoga of work. And the desired result of perfect self-abnegation and utter unselfishness is duly attained. This attainment does not depend on any dogma, doctrine, or belief. Whether one is Christian, Jewish, Gentile, it does not matter. Are you unselfish? That is the question. If you are, you will be perfect without reading a single religious work, without going into a single church or temple. Each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect even without the help of others because they have all the same goal in mind. 
The yogas of work, of wisdom, and of devotion are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha. Fools alone say that work and philosophy are different, not the learned. The learned know that, though apparently different from each other, they at last lead to the same goal of human perfection. <laughs>